Shall we start? Yeah, okay. um, I can just kick off. Um, I'll just, uh, what I'll do is I'll just read out the, the questions. I know I've sent you them in advance, but um, just to... Right, I have them in front of me. Yeah, okay, so mm -hmm. just starting off with, um, if you could tell us a little bit more about yourself as an artist and um, what you value most and your history of experimentation with sound art and where you are now. Well, um, myself as an artist, uh, I can give you a little, little bit of the historical background. Um, I started, uh, as many people do, playing in a rock band and being very much into music early on. Uh, when I was in high school, I uh, happened to take a course at the University of Miami in arranging and composition. And I met a teacher down there who uh, suggested I try going to Berklee College of Music after I graduated. So um, I did, and Berklee was the perfect school in the early 70s because it was uh, still very much uh, about the art of music rather than the business of music, which it seems like it's more now. Uh, so I studied arranging and composition there, and I, uh, my main instrument was the guitar. Um, and, uh, I got very, very, uh, into electronic music and I've always kind of gravitated towards electronic music. Um, they only had at that time two courses, which I had taken both of, and I was looking to continue my studies somewhere. And, um, I found a teacher in Manhattan who taught privately at the new school, excuse me. And so I studied with him for a couple of years. And I also was his roadie. He had a little band, electronic band, and he played uh, at loft parties and that sort of thing. So I, I had a station wagon car. And um, so I was by default his roadie. So I got to immerse myself in a lot of culture in Manhattan in the, in the mid seventies and uh, saw a lot of different music and, you know, of various types. So that had a huge influence on my, uh, my work. Uh, also hung out with some friends who were in art school. My brother was in film school. Uh, so, you know, I was very influenced by just the kind of, you know, the, the various disciplines that were kind of mixing at that time in New York. And of course, there was the whole no wave thing that was happening and kind of a sort of an avant-garde form of punk rock. So all of this uh, really you know, stimulated me in a lot of ways. And I started to compose uh, with a multi-track, uh, reel-to-reel. And then I moved to California and started um, a improv ensemble called Language Lab, which was just a collection of instruments that uh, were either homemade or, you know, altered in some way or just extended techniques on regular instruments. After moving to San Francisco in 83, I got involved with different projects. And um, eventually I uh, started a record label called Silent Records. And um, then I worked in film sound uh, for a year or two, and then went back to running the record label. And uh, then I got um, a job offer to work with Thomas Dolby in uh, Silicon Valley, he had started a company. So I went to work for him as a sound designer. Uh, and then I got a job at another place that was a spin-off from Stanford University that uh, worked in audio software. And then I left there and I've been touring for the past 15 years in uh, Europe mostly, uh, lecturing and performing and that sort of thing. So that's kind of the, uh, not the tweet and not the long form, but some, hopefully somewhere in the middle. Um, so in terms of history of experimentation, uh, I have to say that I think I've always been a very curious person. So I think the, the nature of curiosity is that you want to explore. And exploring is just another term for experimentation, I think, uh, because you get to try things out and... Um, you know, you have ideas that you want to see implemented or tested. Uh, so, yeah, I think experimentation has just been something I've done naturally. I don't, I don't, uh, um, you know, I can't think of a point in my 
career as an artist where I, you know, haven't done that naturally that, you know, I never followed, um, a pre set kind of path. So, um, as far as sound art, um, and where I am now, um, kind of an interesting question. I don't quite know where I am right now. I feel lost in a way, but, um, what do you mean uh, the, you feel lost? Well, uh, I'm kind of stepping away from electronics, um, and software. Mm -hmm. So, um, yeah, over the past couple of years, I've been seeing more and more, um, possibilities, let's say, in acoustic instruments and a mix of acoustic and uh, electric instruments. So I've been sort of turning my attention towards writing for uh, regular instruments. So uh, last year I had the opportunity to, excuse me, uh, write for Pipe Organ in London mm -hmm. at the Union Chapel. And I, I studied a lot about the organ before I, you know, started writing for it. So I gathered a lot of materials because I had never written for, um, for organ before. So I wanted to learn as much as I could. And I, you know, bought some materials to teach myself about the organ and had a chat with the head, uh, organist at the chapel and, um, learned as much as I could about the mechanics and, you know, how things worked and that sort of thing. Um, so what I ended up doing was writing something for the organ that was very drone-like, very minimal. And uh, at that time, I was very interested in interference or, you know, uh, uh, kind of beat tones. So I decided that because I was very interested in just intonation and using just intonation with uh, sine waves, uh, that I would mix the equal temperament uh, sound or the the notes of the organ with just intonation intervals that were very close to those those frequencies those pitches and um so that would create a beating effect in in the chapel so that went quite well better than i had anticipated and i thought wow this is very interesting i want to try to adapt the piece to strings because i love strings and um so I wrote a, a string ensemble, which is something I've wanted to do for a long time. And, uh, it, you know, working with musicians isn't like working with a laptop. You just can't open it and expect them to be there. No. So it's been a long process. Yes, very. Um, so and that's fine. But I thought, wow, well, I'm a string player. I play guitar. So, um, you know, maybe I should try to, uh, you know, brush up on my playing and try some things of my own. So that's when I got interested in the guitar again. Um, you know, I was cleaning out my studio for uh, some work that was being done on the house. And I came across my guitar uh, in the closet and I just sort of started practicing and playing again. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm trying to uh, work uh, now more with other instruments. Like I, I adapted Lunar Mansions, which is the piece I did for the uh, organ to string ensemble and now i'm adapting it to uh electric bass electric guitar tempura harmonium and vibraphone so that's what i'm doing right now so i'd have to say as as a sound artist i'm kind of leaving that world behind and i'm gravitating back towards you know composer musician so that's kind of not full circle but more like a spiral yeah. oh, that's mm. really interesting <laughs> uh, um you said a little bit about uh, what you can, what we can expect from this workshop as participants. Uh, can you give us any mm -hmm. insight into what uh, we we will learn ahead of a workshop, and what is the workshop is about, and what do you want to, what do you want to do in this workshop? Mm -hmm. uh, well, to uh, kind of summarize, the the workshop is a way for people to. Uh, connect again with the unconscious or the imagination. I feel in my 15 years of teaching and performing and meeting people, I've seen a, a slow erosion. Uh, every time I go out to a university, there are younger and younger students. And I've, I've really seen in the past 15 years a, a, a marked change in how people listen. Um, 
it's not all good. It, uh, I find, um, unfortunately, software has become the solution to aesthetic problems rather than the imagination. And what I wanted to do um, was to kind of shift that back towards the imagination and intuition to have people learn to connect with uh, listening in a way that doesn't involve their ears, if that makes sense. It's more about using your intuition and your imagination, uh, learning to connect with the, uh, the rich part of being an artist, the imagination. So that's kind of the, um, <clears throat> the goal of the workshop is to try to teach people very simple techniques that they can use and which over time will help them connect with their unconscious and become better artists, whether it be dancing or film or sound art or what have you. Uh, that's the goal of the workshop. Uh, what people will learn, um, I hope that they learn just that uh, it... There's no easy, quick solution. It's funny because I just said something about like, you know, working with musicians isn't the same as working with a laptop that you really, things are very slow, right? Yeah. And that's the theme of this workshop, slowness uh, and boredom. Uh, but that's exactly what, you know, the path I'm on is to try to dilate time, to slow it down so that people are in the moment rather than one foot in the past and another foot in the future uh, to really become more grounded in, in the present. And to, to really uh, spend time with materials, research, pre-composition, uh, their interests, their intuition, uh, giving time to things. So, yeah, slowing down things is really what um, I hope people will be able to learn from this. Okay. So I had a, a question. Um, mm -hmm. You perform with a, an, in, an impressive list of others. Um, but in particularly in relation to this workshop, could you tell me a little bit more about your work with Pauline Oliveros? Um, so, for example, her ideas on embodiment and deep listening and how they influence what, what you do, or if they influence what you do. Mm -hmm. um, well, yeah, I played with Pauline <clears throat> back in the mid-2000s. I can't remember exactly the year, but uh, we performed together at uh, Rensselaer, Polytechnic in upstate New York. And I've always been a fan of her work. Uh, I remember hearing one of four, her electronic piece for uh, tape, uh, when I was still, you know, kind of uh, working at the new school with the teacher. Uh, you know, he played this for me and it just completely blew my mind. I just, I felt like, you know, she was talking directly to me. So I was always a, a big fan of her work and her sensibility and um, how she approached music. Um, but I don't know a lot about her deep listening. I never took her workshop, so I, I don't think I can really comment on that. But in terms of subtle listening, um, a lot of people ask me the very same question, like, well, how is subtle listening different or similar to deep, deep listening? And I, I don't know that I can answer that. Uh, I know people who've taken her workshop but I've not taken it myself. So, you know, I don't know that I can speak to that. Um, I will say, though, that the, uh, the subtle listening uh, incorporates a lot of uh, meditation <clears throat> and work with sound shapes. So what I work with is more like a system of transcoding. Uh, so sounds in language become shapes, become textures, and those textures can be turned into uh, uh, poems or uh, turned into uh, graphic scores. So this is kind of more the area that I'm working in. Meditation opens up uh, a conduit for um, being able to not uh, make these associations with your intellect, with more your intuition. So meditation kind of gets your mind out of the way and lets you kind of just feel things or engage with your environment in a more direct manner. So I'm not sure how that's similar or different, um, but that's what subtle listening is. Uh, so the next question is the, uh, I guess the rather simple one, but uh, so what do participants need to bring, bring to the workshop and how can they prepare themselves 
uh, for this workshop? Um, I, well, the uh, the list that's on the website is the uh, the list of things they should bring. Really, just something to write in a, a large notebook of some sort. Uh, the larger, the better for this because it is Skype. Um, <clears throat> typically, when I ask people to bring a notebook, they bring like a little like reporter's notebook or something, which is just going to be too small. So something larger, A4 or larger, would be fine. Um, loose clothing so that they're comfortable, uh, you know, pen, pencil, then their imagination. I think that uh, since it's a five-hour workshop, uh, you know, there won't be the same depth that we go into in terms of like creating a piece based on a meditation and that sort of thing. So it's, it's a scaled down workshop, but, uh, I think that in an effort to not leave things out, I've kind of concentrated it. I've made it a little bit more centered on imagination. So I would like to ask about, uh, I'd like to ask you about silence. So that might seem like a bit of a contradiction mm -hmm. because you'll have to speak. <laughs> so um, can you tell me about how important it is to your practice? Uh, well, I, <clears throat> I f I'm interested in uh, sound and music, but there's a quote that is misattributed, I think, to Claude Debussy, who said that uh, music is the sound between the notes. And um, I think that for me, silence and the ability to uh, watch things organically grow, uh, you know, as a piece of music, it requires breathing. It requires uh, uh, being active and being inactive. Uh, my first uh, record on my label, Silent Records, was called Silence. So it's always played an important role in my work. Um, uh, because I've always, uh, well, I've been a meditator for many, many years. So that had a lot to do with it. Uh, I've really, really, um, felt that it was very important for me to maintain some sort of like quiet center so that, uh, I can be in touch with my intuition, my imagination. So silence is very important in my work. Uh, I live in a very, very quiet place in Northern California, uh, and most of the time when I'm writing or working on music, uh, you know, I don't have anything on, no radio, no music. Uh, so I really, really enjoy being able to control my sonic environment um, instead of being inundated with media all the time, as many people are. And I think that today, uh, I mentioned before about how listening is very different. I think with the advent of the internet and smartphones, uh, we're always, and with touchscreens as well, because now you can go to, uh, you know, a petrol station and you have like a, uh, a little touchscreen with advertisements blaring at you now. So we're inundated with media because technology has allowed it to be everywhere, to be ubiquitous. And so the way that we listen now is very different. And we don't have control of our own attention. Our attention is being directed for us all the time by advertisers, media, news, what have you, uh, Facebook, uh, Skype. So the, uh, the ability to have silence is more about taking back control of how we direct our own attention. And that's what I like about living in a very quiet place is that I get to control the sonic environment, which means that I get to control my attention. And that you can only do that if you're quiet internally as well as externally. So the, uh, I'd like to follow up that, uh, that uh, issue of silence because you, know, the, uh, you, probably, you probably agree with this, but I think that silence, when people, when people think about silence or talk about silence, uh, they don't talk about the silence as a unified, universal concept. It, you know, the, your silence is very different from my silence. And the, the, mm -hmm. I, I, I think that's very important to recognize that the, the, when, when I say silence and when you say silence, it's a, there are very different kinds of silence, and uh, not only just for each individual, but also each situation. And especially mm -hmm. in music, in, the, uh, in, in music, silence is very different from one piece to another. 
and uh, we don't yeah. seem to recognize or maybe talk much about that, that aspect. It's almost like um, when people talk about silence, it's uh, almost talking about space. You know, the, when, when we mm -hmm. talk about space, space seems to be unified, something that is very homogeneous thing. Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. It seems like we are, uh, we are mistakenly thinking about silence in a kind of similar way. But actually, it's mm -hmm. uh, you know, so as an artist, we all have a subtle understanding of how silence has very different shape, uh, shape and forms. Uh, so you know, to, yeah. I just want to collect a comment on that. Yeah, no, that's very that's very interesting. It's um, when I was doing a bit of work in field recording. Uh, there are a lot of people that are very interested in nature recording, and there was uh, Gordon Hempton. Mm -hmm who wrote a book called One Square Inch of Silence. Uh, he wasn't really going for silence so much as the sound of the world without our influence. And, and you know, I think that it's very important to listen to nature. And But I think he wanted to go deeper. I think he wanted to really engage on a almost a spiritual level with nature, uh, which is very difficult to do when you're constantly thinking and you're uh, being inundated with media all the time, uh, it's hard to slow down and to get into this space where you can actually engage with nature and let that be your, uh, your silence, so to speak. So it's very interesting that you, um, you say this because it's something that I, I hear a lot, especially with field recorders or nature recorders about silence, um, but it's always been kind of uh, in the back of my mind that everybody's kind of, of talking about it a little bit differently briefly but i was just thinking about okay in relation to kind of um it, interestingly because you said about silence meaning something different to everybody i also think that time operates differently for for different people mm. so that we're not all exactly existing in the same time frame and um, i had this idea that uh, like a lot of the time i'm existing in this kind of fast paradigm that you've described very well where you're inundated with things mm -hmm. and you're continuously trying to keep up or something or time runs out um, so yeah I was wondering if you had thought about other time frames and if these can be approached through sound and listening practices um, the and like I said before uh, with the newer uh, or younger people coming in every year uh, I've seen this this uh, change in how people interact with their environments uh, and not all of it's good. I, I think technology is a wonderful uh, tool in many respects, but I can see its downside more and more. Um, and that is, uh, we all suffer from it. It's not just young people, but young people kind of grew up with it and I think have acclimated to it more naturally. Um, but like I was saying before, because we're inundated with it everywhere we go from Facebook to the, the supermarket, uh, you know, we are constantly being directed, uh, our attentions are being constantly directed and the speed at which that happens, uh, creates this sort of attention deficit disorder with a lot of people. Uh, you know, you have to get what you need to say into 140 characters. Uh, you know, chats are real quick. Uh, people are using emoticons or, um, you know, uh, sort of acronyms for, for what they're trying to say. So everything's really compressed. Everything's got to happen in a tighter time frame. So we speed up because we've got all these things to turn our attention to in, in sequence. And we spool them in and we uh, apply our attention to them and then we move on to the next thing. Um, and this really is uh, having a market ex uh, effect on people and the way that we, uh, we deal with culture and art. Um, and the, the subtle listening workshop was about trying to counteract that, to slow things down, to have people experience their own natural sense of time, uh, their own pace without the, uh, external extract distractions and the, uh, the tendency to have your attention directed for you. So it's really about learning to take control, which is really difficult for younger people, especially. It's funny, um, as I've been teaching this workshop, I, I have, it won't happen in this workshop, but I make them, I make the participants keep a dream journal. 
And this is something that is just is like, A, a little bit too new agey for people. Uh, but B, it's also very uh, strange because a lot of people uh, claim when I ask them to share their dreams and their journals the next morning um, that they don't dream. And I thought that that's, that's really either they're embarrassed about sharing the dreams uh, or they feel exposed or they just really don't dream. And I found that to be, I've seen it more and more. Like the younger people will not share or claim that they don't dream. And the older people in the workshops are more apt to share or claim that they have dreams and share them. So it really kind of, it, it, it sort of tells me a lot about the speed at which people move and how that really affects their psyche and their connection with their, their unconscious. Yeah, that's quite interesting. I, I wonder whether there, uh, there's any research uh, have, that have been done in, in terms of you know, frequency of dreams or people who can remember dreams. I certainly feel like uh, I used to dream quite a lot, but uh, mm -hmm. nowadays, I, you know, the, uh, the, the frequency of the, my uh, dreaming or me remembering the dreams becomes a, a, mm -hmm. a bit of, become rare and rare. I don't know. I haven't yeah. thought about this. I use my dreams yeah. quite productively. <laughs> I come up with my best. <laughs> Very <ideas>. good. <laughs> That's funny you say that. I often say I do my best work when I'm asleep. Yeah, I, I made a joke. Yeah. About it for, I, I had some really good um, ideas, and then I, I managed to put them into writing. But I made a joke that I was, you know, really overworked because <laughs> I was even working yeah. when asleep. So I didn't know if it was a good exactly or a bad thing. <laughs> Yeah, no, it's a very good thing. And it's funny because I, I think that women uh, tend to be more in touch with their intuition. I think men shut that down uh, because it's a rational world and they have to be logical and, and their, their attention's more uh, in the intellect. Uh, and I think women are still in touch with that part of themselves. And I think that's so important, so important that men relearn that you know, their intuition and their imagination are just as important as the intellect. Not that women aren't in touch with the intellect, but they're just, I think they're allowed to be in touch with their intuition. I think it's seen as okay. Where, where for men, I think that's seen as something that's uh, not good or, you know, a little suspect. Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, I think that uh, that's it for the, all the questions. Right? Yeah. Again, uh, thank you so much for taking taking your time. And, sure. Uh, uh, we are we are so much looking forward to this workshop uh, next um, Great. next too. Sunday, and uh, we'll see. Hopefully, see uh, we'll be able to have uh, uh, many participants coming in for uh, for our, our first workshops uh, series. Okay, thank you. Uh,